Get ready to fall in love with a brand new story. So sit back and relax. In a place known as the Knight Imperial Mausoleum, a coffin lay placed and a system prompt indicated that the last disciple of the host had broken through the holy stage, triggering the activation of the meantime system. Suddenly, a man inside the coffin woke up and realized that he had been resurrected after 300 years, and it was revealed that he was a time traveler. He recalled activating the initial system and charting his path to becoming an emperor who accepted female disciples. Unfortunately, he ended up with more than 108 disciples. Just as he contemplated this, a system prompt announced that his fate would change in three minutes as all his disciples had broken through to the saint realm. He inquired of the system whether he could see which disciple had taken 300 years to break through, but his request was denied. Yet he uncovered that the penultimate disciple had reached the saint realm 230 years ago. This realization dawned on him that had the last disciple broken through earlier, his resurrection would have occurred sooner, and then his fate started changing. An old monk named Mr. Lai, who was at the late half-saint stage, performed a kind of magic. His followers ventured to the location to inspect the coffin. Upon arrival, they were astonished to find a coffin crafted from a rare universe wood, perfect for storing top-grade spiritual treasures and magical weapons. As spiritual energy flowed into the coffin, they believed they had stumbled upon a treasure. Mr. Lee approached and opened the coffin. To their amazement, they discovered a deceased man inside, brimming with spiritual energy. One among them speculated that he might be the supreme emperor who had died of old age. The notion arose that someone had placed a treasure in his mouth to preserve his body's spiritual essence. Hence, Mr. Lai extended his hand to open the man's mouth. Just as his hand was about to make contact, the seemingly dead man opened his eyes. Surprise gripped them all as they saw him alive, prompting them to inquire about his presence and purpose there. He explained that the tomb had been constructed for him. This revelation led them to assume he was the supreme demon emperor who had died three centuries ago. However, Mr. Lai was convinced that he wasn't the emperor and had only recently attained the concentration realm. Despite his protests, their aggression escalated, and they demanded information about the treasure, resorting to threats. As one of them poised to strike him with a sword, he effortlessly arrested the blade's motion using his fingers that leads them to wonder how could he manage to stop it. In the midst of this, he just shattered the sword into two pieces. Fuming with anger, he seized his neck in disbelief at the audacity of a Shenting Realm individual challenging him. In a swift response, his companion hurried to intervene, shouting to release him. Yet this outcry fueled his rage that leads to the demise of his friend, who had reached the later stages of the Shenting Realm. Subsequently, he swiftly dispatched another man with a single lethal blow, cleanly severing the man's head from his body. Mr. Lay's associates asked him what they should do next, and he suggested that life was more important than treasure, so they needed to run quickly. He felt that although it seemed as if he wasn't pursuing them, he utilized his spiritual energy, causing Mr. Lai to fall to the ground. He wondered why there was an array and speculated about how strong his opponent was, even entertaining the possibility that he might be the supreme demon emperor. Mr. Lai's companions pleaded for mercy, explaining that they were employees of Mr. Lai and hadn't intended to offend him. However, he paid no heed to their pleas and swiftly dispatched them with a single blow, Mr. Lai concluded that the person before him must not be human and liken him to a ghost. He pleaded for his life, vowing never to repeat his actions. In response, he asked Mr. Lee about the location of the man who had constructed the mausoleum. Mr. Lai claimed ignorance, but suggested that the secret department of Imperial Guards in Yunfen City might possess that information. The secret department of Imperial Guards was an intelligence organization founded 200 years ago by a mysterious individual. Those willing to pay a sufficient price could obtain information from them. He also mentioned that the organization held influence over the entire Zhang Yuan region. Upon after hearing about intelligence organization, he thought it must be hard to expand an intelligence organization to that extent. Mr. Lee offered the way to them if he spared his life, but just then he dissipated him and took his life in a second. After that system prompt gave him the task to find the lost disciples and every time he meet one, he can get a reward. Now he was happy, as it was finally his turn to reap the harvest. Indy Castle ranked 36th among the best array masters in the Zhang Yuan region. Xu Fu instructed his subordinates to send someone to ask the secret department of Imperial Guards to inform Lei Yushin that there had been an accident in her hometown. She was determined to make the world aware that anyone who dared to desecrate her master's tomb would face consequences. She thought about trying her best to find the immortal array that could resurrect him. On the other side, the immortal array wandered through the market and found Yunfen City more lively than before. Suddenly, he realized that he hadn't eaten for hundreds of years and felt an intense hunger, so he headed to find the best restaurant in Yunfen City. A young man indicated Hai Shen Lao restaurant owned by Lady Cook. 
Upon hearing this, he got excited about the renowned Hai Shen Leo and Macdane Chicken. However, to his surprise, he was informed that she had become a saint and rarely left her abode. He contemplated whether his 40th disciple, Fang Xiao Tong, who was skilled in cooking, could be her disciple, and he proceeded to the restaurant. Inside the restaurant, he found the dishes ordinary except for one particular dish, so he decided to stick with the uniquely named monster-flavored Buddha jumps over the wall. He overheard Mr. Pan, who had ordered the famous monster-flavored Buddha jumps over the wall in Yunfen City, a dish that only he could afford. The demon emperor decided to order the same dish for himself. However, he had to pay before the dish was served, and the waitress asked whether he'd like to pay with spiritual stones or gold coins. He chose to pay using spiritual stones. His generous payment prompted discussions among the surrounding people. They commented on his order, mentioning that he had chosen the same dish as Mr. Pan and had been even more lavish in his spending. They noted that even five spiritual stones were insignificant to him. Soon after, Mr. Pan's order arrived. He informed his companions that the dish not only tasted delicious, but also had cultivation-enhancing properties. He had such a high opinion of himself that he believed only a man of his stature could appreciate such a gish. On the other side, the demon emperor wondered if the taste was similar to that of Fan Xiaotong's cooking. As he tasted the dish, he slammed his hand on the table in anger and questioned whether this food was meant for pigs. Mr. Pan reacted defensively, pointing out that the demon emperor had ordered the same dish and mockingly asked whether someone from a rural background like him could truly appreciate its contents. The demon emperor retorted that food like that could only deceive people like Mr. Pan, who was a wealthy fool. In the midst of the exchange, the demon emperor summoned the waitress and requested the presence of the chef. As chef late stage of the Shenting realm, Dong Liu came, he asked if he has any suggestions for him. Everyone around there thought, how dare he stir up trouble in Hai Shen Lao, and considered him just a racketeer. Then the demon emperor explained the dish. The ingredients for this dish needed to be pre-dried for 49 days to bring out the maximum umami flavor. However, the chef had replaced them with fresh ingredients. He further mentioned that the ribs were not baked with martial fire and the meat was too hard. The stock was also not sufficiently cooked. So how could he claim that it was his signature dish? After seeing all of this, Mr. Pan expected that a guy in the early stage of the concentration realm questioning the signature dish of a chef in the late stage of the Shenting realm was going to be a good show. And then the chef realized and knelt down before the demon emperor, acknowledging him as an expert asking for forgiveness. Mr. Pan got shocked to see him like that and asked why he had cowtoned and knelt to him, to which he said that his analysis was good and his dish was really rubbish. Mr. Pan angrily responded that he loved eating rubbish all the time, to which the demon emperor sarcastically replied that rubbish was the only food suitable for a guy like him. After hearing his insult, he became furious and tried to beat the demon emperor, but he easily handled him and banged his head on the table. The waitress wondered how he dared to challenge the genius of the Chang sect. Mr. Pan also warned him to let go of him, otherwise he would make him suffer. Then the demon emperor threw him out of the hall and everyone ran to him. The chef wondered how he had defeated Master Pan, who was in the Tongzuan realm with one move. He reminded him that he was in trouble now, but the demon emperor had merely crippled his cultivation, which meant he was still alive. The chef suggested that he could stall for him so he could get out of there, as the Chaiyang sect's elders had reached the saint realm and he had injured their core disciple. Thus, the Chaiyang sect would never let him go. But the demon emperor assured him that he could handle the situation and told him that he needed to eat first. The chef wondered how he could be so calm when he had already offended the Chaiyang sect and he wondered about his identity. While eating, the demon emperor asked the chef about his boss, Lady Cook. The chef informed him that she had been traveling for nearly a hundred years and the last time he had seen her was five years ago. He added that her properties had been left to her disciples. The demon emperor asked for the address of the secret department of imperial guards, but the chef hadn't heard of it. He also mentioned that he would have to rely on the chef for food and shelter during those days. At the Chaiyang sect, they heard that Wen Hong's cultivation had been crippled. They initially thought it was Fang Xiao Tong who had dared to attack a member of the Chaiyang sect. However, one of Wen Hong's subordinates corrected him, stating that a young man had crippled Wen Hong's cultivation with a single move, which was unusual. The third elder was now leading a team to the Knight Imperial Mausoleum to seize the treasure. He ordered them to keep a close watch on Hai Shen Leo and the young man. He also declared that upon his return, he would crush the boy to pieces. At the mausoleum, ranked 20 Lei Yushin never thought that her master's body would be stolen. She knew that her master's body was beyond the scope of body refining, rendering it useless to an ordinary man. Since they had dared to steal her master's body, she was determined to get it back even if it meant her own death. 
Zhu Shu informed her that someone had triggered the interdiction of the outer city and destroyed the array. In response, Lei decided to teach them a lesson to prevent them from making the place their own home. Upon entering the mausoleum, they praised their third elder's array technique that had taken only a few seconds to break the interdiction. When they saw Lai and her group, she stepped forward and asked how they dared to come there. In response, the young man countered by asking if she didn't want the same thing they did. He warned her to leave the treasure, and he would spare her life. Seeing the murderous look in their eyes, he realized that instead of being scared, they were willing to hurt. He told her not to blame them for bullying weak women. Just then, they all attacked. As they were about to attack, Feng Xiaotong activated the array and summoned the spirits. In an instant, all the soldiers vanished into the air. Seeing this, the third elder realized that she had used the soul's summoning array and began to tremble. He asked her about her relationship with the soul eater, but she didn't reveal anything. She activated the array again and detected the soul to drain its energy and hurt it. After the fight, La jokingly teased Zhu Fu that she was much worse at stealing memories than their master. Then they headed to the Chiang sect in Yunfen City. In the restaurant, after only half a day, the demon emperor had reached the second level of the concentration realm. He felt that he deserved to have the perfect qualifications to change his life. He wondered if he could break through the concentration realm in a month. Suddenly, he spotted something outside his window. He came out of the room and asked the chef about the noise outside the restaurant. The chef informed him that a lot of people had just seen a ship the size of a mountain flying through the air. The demon emperor decided to check it out, thinking that maybe the ship would land in Yunfen City. On their way, the chef got tired of walking and realized that he could barely keep up with the demon emperor. He was surprised to learn that the demon emperor had broken through a realm in just half a day. Upon seeing the ship, he guessed that it might be Noh's Ark, created by Lai Yashin, his twentieth disciple. However, he realized that it was over the Chang sex. Nonetheless, he decided to go there to investigate. Lai Yashin emerged from the ship and challenged Su Yu and Hao to come out. Onlookers wonder how she dared to challenge the leader of the Chang sect, who had reached the saint realm. Fortunately, the demon emperor recognized his first disciple. At the Chiang sect, he knew that he didn't have to personally deal with them, but he wondered why Yushin had a conflict with them. On the other hand, she had no idea that the Chiang sect had raided the Night Imperial Mausoleum 13 times in the past two years. She concluded that the disappearance of her master's body was undoubtedly related to them. Suddenly, the first leader of the Chiang sect appeared in front of her. She had just reached the eighth level of the Saint Realm a few days ago. He underestimated her and charged up his sword, launching an attack against her. Their swords clashed and he realized that only their leader could wield such incredible power. However, if the battle continued in that manner, he would be severely injured. Attempting to retreat, she reminded him that escaping was not that simple. She launched a powerful attack that knocked him to the ground. Their chief arrived and expressed surprise that she was the one causing trouble. He asked why she was so furious. She demanded that he return everything he had stolen from the Knight Imperial Mausoleum. In exchange, she promised to spare the lives of the others, but he must die. He underestimated her, thinking that a woman who practiced the auxiliary way wouldn't pose a threat to him. Even if he herded her, he believed there would be much applause. Yershin charged forward, intent on launching an indiscriminate attack against the Chiang sect. After her attack, he ordered the array to start and the fight began. However, he soon realized that she was a demon cultivator. His soldiers were instructed to run if a flying sword was thrown at them, as they wouldn't be able to resist it. With the giant ship, it wouldn't take long to raise a sect. In the midst of the air, the chief of the Chaying sect initiated an attack on her. Just as he launched his attack, she gathered all of her spiritual power, giving her a fiery appearance. Chef admired her cool suit that could deflect the most terrifying sword energy in an instant. The Yuan Emperor thought she deserved to be his disciple. She countered by launching an attack on his subordinates. However, Yuan Hao managed to capture her with chains due to her momentary carelessness. As he prepared to strike her, a voice from the ship warned that if he dared to harm Yushin, the ship's owner would destroy the Chiang sect. Zhu Fu emerged from the ship. Upon seeing her, he declared that he would hurt Lei Yushin first, then deal with her. Zhu Fu first attempted to free Lai from the chains, but she couldn't break through his swordsmanship with her abilities. As it seemed they were about to face defeat, Demon Emperor suddenly appeared on the scene. He wouldn't allow anyone to harm them and block Yuan Hao's powerful attack without being harmed himself. Yuan Hu wondered how he accomplished such a feat. Both of them were surprised to see their master after a long time. He instructed them to deal with the guy behind them first. He already knew that the blow had caused his body to die, but his primordial spirit was not destroyed. Therefore, if they could work together, they could take him down.
In the meantime, Yunxia released the aura of the Emperor and revealed that he was the Blood Emperor of the Shining Star Holy Land. He warned them to give up their cultivation immediately, otherwise, he would hurt everyone around them. She thought her master was right behind them watching. Her master explained that it was just a divine thought projected by the Emperor to scare people. People around them discussed the person who had blocked Su Yuan Hao's sword energy. They realized that he had just reached the second level of the concentration realm. However, some were skeptical as cultivators of the concentration realm shouldn't be able to fly. He reminded Yuan Hao that the Zhang Yuan region belonged to the Shining Star Holy Land. Before Yuan Hao could reply, the person began to dissipate. Both of his disciples looked surprised by this. He clarified that he was unable to oppose him 300 years ago, but now the time had come. At the Shining Star Holy Land, the Blood Emperor couldn't believe that they had challenged the majesty of the Holy Land. He called the guards, thinking that the Divine Needle had perished along with the separated body. He ordered the guards to find the Saint of the Art of Medicine and also informed the other lords. Suddenly, Emperor Flaming arrived and inquired about the matter. The Blood Emperor informed him that he had been struck by a magic needle from out of nowhere and had collapsed on the floor. As he tried to explain further, mentioning the second level of the Concentration Realm, he suddenly died. Seeing him, Emperor Flaming guessed that it wasn't a mere trauma. If the Blood Emperor hadn't cultivated the soul art, he would have been dead. He wondered who blood had offended to be in such a situation. Emperor Flaming contemplated that Mr. Yi had effortlessly destroyed the Emperor's shadow, and he was the master of both the misses. On the other side, the two disciples finally saw their master. However, she thought Yi Bai was just a divine thought and couldn't believe her eyes. She mentioned that she had found the land of the ancient immortal king and believed there might be an immortal array there that could resurrect him. When he spoke to them, they were surprised and started crying. They had waited 300 years to see their master so closely, and it wasn't a dream. Yibai assured them that he wasn't a divine thought, otherwise he wouldn't automatically dissipate when his energy ran out. He was alive and back in action. Lai Yushin was still afraid it might be a dream. Then the system prompt gave him a 10 times cultivating speed bonus and the Centennial Cultivation Disciple version as a reward for meeting his two disciples. Upon learning this, he thought about how if he found a few more disciples, his speed could increase even more. He pondered on how to use the Disciple version reward. The system informed him that he only needed to contact the disciples to distribute it, either directly or indirectly. So he told his disciples that they had tried to hurt a sword cultivator of the same realm as themselves and had thought too highly of their abilities. As a punishment, he decided to give them ten lashes each. He administered the punishment, reflecting on how fortunate he was to be in Yunfen City, as those two girls could have died. During the lashes, Fu realized that her cultivation was soaring. She told him that they couldn't accept such a reward for their mistakes, but Yi instructed them to accept the punishment. After transferring the disciple version reward through the lashes, they thanked him. However, he knew he needed to find some strong disciples, as these two lacked attacking power. Back at the castle, they informed him that they had failed to protect the other disciples. Upon hearing this, he couldn't believe that the nine holy places were responsible for their separation. Yushin mentioned that Tabai was also in the Zhang Yuan region. He knew of her talent and speculated that she might be on the verge of becoming an emperor. Fu added that after breaking through the half-emperor level, Tabai had arrived at the Shining Star Holy Land, but no one knew what had happened next. Currently, she resided at Taibei Sword Villa in Lu Wing City. He then ordered them to set off for Lu Wing City immediately. Three days later, while on Noah's Ark, he managed to break through five realms in three days. This accomplishment would typically take over three years for ordinary people. Next, he aimed to break through the Tongzhuan realm. A day later, he asked his servant to provide him with all the information about Taibei Sword Villa. The servant explained that there was a martial arts gathering at the villa. He elaborated that the leader of Taibei Sword Villa had been injured for a long time and had little cultivation left. As a result, she spent her days drinking. The villa had been bustling with activity in its prime, attracting numerous sword cultivators who came to learn sword skills. Upon hearing this, Yibai realized that he was the only one who could rouse her from her current state. At Taibai Sword Villa, a coordinator requested his wine bottle. People in the Ku were each holding a bottle of wine. Observing a man with an attractive bottle, they discussed how the wine bottle alone could be sold for several spiritual stones. It was revealed that the wine bottle belonged to Ye Bai, who only poured a single glass of wine for his master. Upon smelling it, he contemplated that if he could drink a mouthful of that wine in his lifetime, it would be worth it. Ye Bai also instructed the coordinator to convey a message to his master. The message included two points. First, a drunken woman doesn't know her hometown, and second, a poem, a bucket of wine, a long song, and a sword. With the wine in hand, the coordinator took it to his master. 
Following this, his disciples also expressed a desire to taste the wine. However, he refused and warned them that if they tried it again, he would respond rudely to them. Inside the villa, Tebai was drinking, so her disciple reminded her that she had been drinking for so many days and it was time to stop. However, Tebai changed the topic and told Shan that her sword technique was okay, but she had cared too much about the shape and ignored the potential. Shan asked if Tebai was feeling sad because of her grandmaster's death day, but Tebai ignored the question and instructed her to take a break, as her wine should be brought to her as well. In a moment, the coordinator arrived with her wine. As Taibai took a sip and smelled the aroma, she realized that the wine was of high quality. She thought that perhaps when she got drunk, she might be able to see her master again. The coordinator informed her that the wine had been brought by a man from a prominent family who had reached the seventh level of the concentration realm. He also conveyed a message that the man had sent for her. Excitedly, she asked where the man was and the coordinator informed her that he was waiting by the door. Taibai hurriedly went to the door. At the door, they noticed Taibai approaching. To avoid being recognized, they covered their faces. When Taibai arrived and inquired about the glass of wine, he sensed her melancholy. Nonetheless, even if she had become dispirited, he was determined to challenge her and refine her like a sword today. She asked him about the message and who had conveyed it to him. However, he didn't provide an answer, instead asked if she liked the wine he had given her. Feeling a sense of familiarity with those people, Taibai inquired about their identity and what they truly wanted from her. He assumed the role of a sword cultivator and requested that she lower her cultivation to the same level as his. He proposed a sparring match between them and instructed that she wasn't allowed to regain her strength until the end of the fight. She agreed to the challenge. In the martial arts arena, she informed him that her time was limited and they could practice only until dusk. Taibai had lowered her cultivation to the first level of the concentration realm, making it easier for him to teach her a lesson. As the fight was about to begin, she suggested to him that he should use his best sword technique, Otherwise, he wouldn't be able to withstand her for even two rounds. With that, he swung his sword to attack her. She anticipated that he would attack from the right, but he bluffed and changed his approach. They engaged in a deliberate and strategic fight, yet to her surprise, she couldn't even touch him. He reminded her that underestimating the enemy was the first taboo on the battlefield, and as a result, Taibai clearly lost the first round. Taibai admitted that she had underestimated him, but now she was well prepared for the next round. She wielded a green lotus sword, Type 2, employing the stroke of genius, her best swordsmanship. She launched an attack, confident that once she initiated it, he would be defeated. However, he simply countered her attack, causing her to stumble and fall to the ground. He advised her to raise her cultivation to his level. In a fit of anger, she charged up and unleashed the Green Lotus Sword, Type 3. Yet again, she faced defeat. With this third loss, she concluded that the man was familiar with her swordsmanship and demanded to know his identity. In response, he instructed Fu to activate the array. Suddenly, Tabe realized that she had been tricked and her cultivation level began to rapidly diminish. Taibai realized that he had tricked her from the beginning, starting with the wine, then leading her to suppress her cultivation level, reducing her perception, and finally employing the spirit forbidden array. In a moment, Shan arrived at the martial arts field. Despite Taibai's insistence to stay away, Shan disregarded her and approached to confront him. He informed them that both of them would meet their end that day. Despite Taibei's anger, she couldn't deny that he had sealed her cultivation. She attacked him with spiritual energy. Fu and Yashin were concerned about Taibei's willingness to fight to the death, but they trusted in their master's abilities. Taibei attacked him with a deadly intent, yet she began to wonder why his speed was increasing instead of decreasing, considering his cultivation had been sealed as well. Once again, he managed to land a punch on her, leaving her puzzled as to how he could easily breach her defenses each time. He taunted her, telling her she was not qualified to decline and insulted her past to provoke her, suggesting that her master had molded her into what she had become. Tebai struck him forcefully, but he narrowly evaded. She threatened him, vowing not to let him insult her master and determine to hurt him. He recognized that he needed to stop her, having brought her senses back and prepared for the final step, quenching. He received the Kasuanyuan sword intent disciple version as a reward for meeting his third disciple. Extracting the Kasuanyuan sword technique, he launched his attack on her. Meanwhile, Emperor Flaming noticed the sword aura and deduced the direction to Tebe Sword Villa. His subordinate advised him to arrive there first as an event of this nature hadn't occurred in hundreds of years. In the martial arts field, Tebe was shocked by the sword technique displayed before her. She realized that she couldn't die just yet, as she needed to take care of Shan and find her martial sisters and master. After Tebe's situation, Shan declared that she would fight to the death and step forward to attack Fu, but she stumbled and fell onto her large body feeling embarrassed. She stepped back, 
Yibai explained that Shan's sister had been drinking and feeling depressed, and he was there to remind her of her swordsmanship. Despite everything, Shan regarded her sister as the best person in the world. Yibai emphasized that if they didn't wake up her sister, she would lose control. He further mentioned that she would be lucky if she could harness and absorb the sword intent. Suddenly, the owner of Zhuan Villa, the head of the Zhangzhen family, and the leader of the Changxiao sect all reached the Holy King realm. Shan questioned how Yi Bai could remain so calm when his disciples were clearly outmatched with him. In light of the situation, they speculated that the leader of Taibei's sword villa was refining something, as they had observed her progress from the seventh level of the Holy King realm to the half emperor realm. The leader of Zhulong Villa expressed a desire to obtain the high quality sword treasure, believing it could potentially elevate him to the rank of martial emperor. He decided to intervene to prevent her refining process as no one dared to challenge their team. However, Fub announced that their leader was grasping the essence of swordsmanship, and anyone who approached before she completed, it would be seen as an enemy of Taibei Sword Villa. The consequences would be borne by those who challenged them. The leader of Zhu Long took this as an insult and attacked Fu, resulting in his sword being shattered. The other two individuals grew fearful, speculating that the skill displayed wasn't typical of a cultivator in the Shenting realm. They suspected she was concealing her true cultivation level. Fu clarified that she intended to face only one challenger, but she lost control. She assured them it wouldn't happen again, which relieved those around her. During this time, Taibai elevated her level to the half-emperor realm. If she advanced her level further, she would reach the great emperor realm. Finally, Taibai regained her senses and asked the masked man one last time about his identity. He removed his mask, revealing his true identity to her. Upon learning that he was her master, Tabai found it hard to believe since her master couldn't even break through the body refining realm. He showed her the punishment whip and Fu congratulated her for breaking the shackles. Tabai approached him knowing she had gone through a tough time during those years. Eventually, she started crying, prompting him to tell her to stop lest she make him feel sentimental as well. Flaming Emperor was shocked by the strength of the master, who was at the peak of the half-emperor realm, realizing it must be formidable. They all knelt down before him, expressing their willingness to affiliate with Master Taibai from now on. However, Yibai had a different plan. He asked sarcastically if they wanted to share a meal before they left, and then told them to depart immediately. Taibai requested that her master take Shan on an adventure to a secret place thousands of miles away to gain more experience. He suggested that she should go with Shan herself. Taibai explained that the rules did not allow people with cultivation levels higher than the Tanzuan realm to enter. She revealed that the secret place opened only once every 50 years and that she had failed in her attempt before. She also mentioned that the three shrines sent core disciples into it every time it opened. This led her to believe it was okay for him to take Shan with him, as Shan could be of help to him. Yibai agreed to go there in three days. In the West Room, the system prompt congratulated him for reaching the Tongzhuan realm and unlocking five of his cards. He could choose one of the cards to refine. Later, Yibai learned that Little Lightning was the legendary entry-level heavenly tribulation in the immortal world, known as the 49 Thunder Tribulation, and its power could not be underestimated in this mysterious world. Outside, his disciples noticed the thunder clouds and wondered if their master was responsible. Suddenly, a large thunder eruption occurred. A few moments later, Yibai asked Taibai to fetch him a dress. When she entered the West Room with the clothes, she became afraid to see him half-naked. He assured her that he wouldn't do anything to her. As she handed him the clothes, he asked her if she still found him strange after hundreds of years, and he held her hand. Suddenly, he pulled her close, causing her to fall onto him. He realized he had pulled her too forcefully, and felt embarrassed by his actions. Taibai was frightened and quickly apologized to him, but it was too late. He had already sensed his own feelings. Then she let out a shout. The noise caught Fu and Yushin's attention, and they came to see what happened. They were surprised by the scene they walked in on, and Yushin teased him, asking why he didn't let them join or at least inform them. After that, he told Taibei to inform Shan to pack her bags as they were ready to depart. Before their departure, Taibei gave him a space treasure containing essentials for the journey, and then they took flight. When they landed in a forest, Shan suspected they might be at the wrong entrance to the secret forest. Yibai explained that the secret forest was on the verge of opening. Shortly thereafter, people from the Tanki Shrine approached them and offered to guide her to the secret forest. However, she declined their assistance. But he gave her a token that took her at least half a day from there to the secret forest, and if people bother her, she will be fine if she show it to them. Yibai took the token immediately and thanked him for help, to which Chi Man stated that they should help each other on the way to cultivation and leave. Shan mused that the outside world might not be as bad as Taibai had portrayed it. Yibai questioned whether she believed the Chi Man was kind to her, 
due to her appearance or if he was simply acting out of genuine kindness. To some extent, she considered that possibility because they hadn't displayed their wealth or power openly. Yi Bai found it hard to believe she was so trusting, then he revealed the truth about the token. He explained that it was actually a tracking array and recounted their conversation. When he had asked her if she was alone and he was trying to gauge their identities, she had accidentally revealed that they were self-employed. He reminded her that the world was far more sinister and corrupt than she could imagine and she promised to remember his teachings. She inquired why they didn't take action against those who were clearly capable, and he told her that they refrained from doing so for the sake of the Holy Land. She suggested they could just discard the token, but he cautioned that doing so would make them targets. Inside the forest, he overheard that the survivors would be automatically released from the forest in ten days. Those possessing the secret forest tokens would receive rewards of varying degrees. Additionally, the three shrines aimed to gather 100 secret forest tokens, yet no one had managed to collect that many since the forest's discovery. Whoever obtained all the tokens could effectively dominate the entire secret forest. Yabai surmised that they were given the tracking token so that the others would attempt to hurt them and seize the token, thus preserving their shrine's reputation. He recognized that even after hundreds of years, they still played dirty. Moments later, a passage opened in the wall and people speculated that the event was about to begin. Sean urged him to enter, but he explained that entering a few minutes early or late wouldn't make much difference. Ten minutes later, a shining star shrine and shrine appeared. The Taiyanqi shrine instructed its members to enter and claim the reward, and then they moved forward to attack, attempting to prevent them from entering. However, Yibai managed to evade their attacks and swiftly moved past the shrine members entering the passage. Observing their strength, one of them speculated that one of the two individuals had reached the sixth level of the Tongzhuan realm, while the other had only attained the first level of the same realm. They felt confident that the two would meet their demise within the next ten days, and that was the first time they have seen people take advantage of the Tanki Shrine in hundreds of years. One of the Shrine members reported to their master that they had encountered these two individuals before and explained the situation. Their master then provided the Shining Star Shrine and Shrine with tracking jade tokens containing the tracking marks of these two individuals. The Star Shrine member assured her master, Mr. Yan, that her disciple would bring the bodies of the two individuals to him. However, he stopped her angrily. Inside the secret forest, Shan pondered the nature of the person she was with, even that he had herded an elite disciple of the shrine and taken all their tokens. She explained that they had previously offended the Tianqi shrine before entering, so she wondered what the consequences would be when they exited. Ye Bai reminded her that if others were unkind, then they shouldn't blame him for reciprocating in the same manner. He emphasized that they were merely a few half-emperors, which astonished her. On their journey, they encountered a large, heart-piercing spotted snake with the strength of the third level of the Tongzhuan realm. Although she could easily defeat it, she had a fear of snakes. Upon learning this, he assigned her the task of defeating the snake. Otherwise, he warned her that he might leave her behind. She reminded him that she was genuinely afraid of the snake, but he made it clear that acting cute wouldn't work. Summoning her courage, she attempted to hurt the snake, but when it let out a roar, fear overcame her like that of a child, and she clung to him. He reassured her that the snake wasn't powerful, but if she were to become entangled in his body, she might be at risk of death. Determined to prove herself in front of her grandmaster, she readied the green lotus sword style and decapitated the snake in a single stroke, celebrating her victory. Yibai interrupted her celebration, warning her that if she continued to be so frivolous, he would teach her a lesson on behalf of her sister. She noticed a stone on the snake's head and Yi Bai informed her that this particular snake was much stronger than other beasts, which was why she needed to remove its head to ensure its demise. He removed the stone from its head and handed it to her. It appeared slimy and repulsive, but it seemed to possess a mysterious energy. Yi Bai explained that there was no demon core and demon beasts of the Tongzhuan realm, so this stone must be a unique product of the secret forest. If she infused her spiritual power into it, she might be able to uncover its secrets. Following his guidance, she channeled her spiritual power into the stone. Astonishingly, she effortlessly broke through from the sixth level of the Tongzhuan realm to the seventh level, all while breaking her cultivation shackles. Grateful for his guidance, she thanked him, feeling fortunate that her master had given her such a valuable item. Suddenly, they heard someone screaming for help, so they decided to take a look as many demon beasts had been herded, so it was time for a change. As they went to look, they found the Starshine Shrine and Shane wondered if they should help her. But Yibai knew her trap and swiftly channeled magical power towards her, revealing her intentions. She praised his appearance and she had no wonder that he dared to steal all the secret tokens of the Tanki Shrine. Shane knew that she was an elite from one of the other two shrines and wondered how she had found them when her master had already incapacitated everyone in the Tanki Shrine. 
They were surrounded, Sir Yi Bai mocked them, asking if they truly needed a surprise attack against just the two of them with their low-level cultivation. Shane didn't even know that a whole bunch of people were hiding there, to which her master told her that they were stronger than her, so it was normal that she didn't discover where they were hiding. Besides, the Shining Star Shrine was known for its trickery. They all felt insulted and threatened. They believed that anyone insulting the Shining Star Shrine deserved death and attacked them. Yibai instructed Shane to use the Green Lotus Sword Style 9 and skillfully manage the enemy sword play. He noticed that her sister hadn't told her that the Green Lotus Sword Style 9 was not a solo technique. So he decided to take her through the real final style of the Green Lotus Sword and began performing it. The shrines were surprised at how someone with a cultivation level of just first Tongzhuan realm could accomplish this and wondered how he could break through the full power of the peak of the Shenting realm. But before they could react, they all vanished, consumed by Yi Bai's power. He asked Shane if she was scared, but she refused, knowing he was there with her. He ordered her to dispose of the bodies and search for the tokens. She became frightened, but he showed no compassion, understanding that she would become useless if she didn't practice. After a while, she collected all the secret forest tokens and the tracking jade card. He praised her for her hard work, and from that point on, he would entrust such tasks to her. After that, he checked the tracking jade, which showed many green dots. This indicated that the half-emperor of the Tianqi Shrine must have shared their location with the other two shrines. They had used their magic to replicate all those tracking devices, which would be a significant help to them. It was time for the hunter and the prey to switch places. According to the tracking marker, their target was in the hole in the tallest tree. As they entered the tree hole, they decided to split up and were instructed to take the bodies to the elder. Suddenly, they spotted a tracking token and realized they had been deceived. They started to leave immediately, but before they could react or depart, they all became trapped. That's when Shen arrived and easily dispatched everyone, thanks to her master's array. This time, he instructed her not to do anything to the bodies, she just needed to search for their belongings. Two minutes later, she had collected a full bag of booty, and he dissipated the bodies. Upon seeing his array, she wondered if she could learn some array techniques as well. However, he heard her thoughts and told her to let go of that idea. Then they left the place as the next challenge awaited. She was amazed that he even knew that people from another shrine were coming. He suggested she use sparring to improve her cultivation. As her cultivation improved, everything became clearer to her. She had no doubt that he had become her sister's master because he made very accurate predictions. A while later, members of the shrine came to search for them. As they set foot at the entrance of the tree hole, they realized they had been deceived and ordered everyone to leave. Shan grew bored with the familiar smells, hunting methods, and even the familiar words. He deactivated all the arrays and told Shan to move ahead and attack them. After some time, they sat together, and she mentioned that they had collected 76 tokens in just three days. She was eager to find the remaining 24 tokens, but he told her that she needed to use energy crystals for a quick ascent first, after that, they could look for the remaining 24 tokens when she was stronger. Both of them began their cultivation improvement, and after four days, they encountered other survivors. They asked them to hand over their tokens, promising to let them go in return. The survivors complied, giving them the tokens and then making their escape. With these tokens, they now had 100, and Sean wondered what kind of treasure they could obtain once they had enough. She had heard earlier that some treasures could react when placed together and might even merge into a more powerful treasure. So she asked him if these tokens could also be fused into a treasure. He attempted to fuse them, but was shocked by the result and suspected that something was amiss. In the process of fusion, as it spread, Shan slowly transferred to the outside of the forest and he failed to catch her. He guessed that some kind of mechanism must have been triggered, prematurely ending the secret land and ejecting the survivors. He knew that many enemy people were waiting outside the secret land and Shan had been sent out, so the consequences were simply unthinkable. He asked the system how he could quickly get out of there, to which the system informed him that after successfully refining the core of the secret land, he could leave and take the entire secret land with him. After hearing that, he started refining, realizing that if anything bad happened to Shan, Taibai wouldn't forgive him. Moreover, because she had called him master hundreds of times during the last seven days, he had to do his best to save her. On the other side, the shrine's people reported to their masters that their tokens had been taken by a young man at the first grade of the Tongzhuan realm. In a moment, Shan landed outside the secret forest, and Mr. Yan caught her, demanding to know where that man was. She knew she was in trouble and regretted her mean and ill-conceived idea. She had dug her own grave. He threatened her, saying he would hurt him if she didn't tell him. So she informed him that her sister was a half-emperor. However, he showed no fear and confidently stated that he could handle her sister. She went on to mention that her sister was Taibei, the owner of the Taibei Sword Villa from Lu Guang City, and she was at the peak of the half-emperor realm. 
Furthermore, her sister's master had broken through to the great emperor realm when they came there. After hearing about her powerful background, those around her realized that she wouldn't be afraid of those from the Holy Lands. Mr. Yan asked Elder Mew if he thought she was telling the truth. Another man spoke up, stating that he was from Lu Wang City and could vouch for the truth of what she had said. He explained that abnormal phenomena had occurred three times at Taibai Villa ten days ago. Upon hearing this, Mr. Yan decided to spare her life for now. Hurting her would surely lead to retaliation from her sister and master, making the situation far more serious than losing twenty tokens from the secret land. Mr. Yan inquired about her relationship with the young man, to which she replied that he was her fellow brother. She understood that her master could handle several half-emperors easily, so she decided to wait patiently until he emerged. Within the secret forest, he realized that with his current speed, completing his refining would take at least an entire day. Waiting a full day would be too late, even if Shan could temporarily intimidate them. There was no guarantee they wouldn't harm her in the meantime, so he had no choice but to take a pill to expedite his refining. Meanwhile, the shrine's members noticed someone was exiting the secret land, and then the passage closed. They were puzzled since only seven days had passed, and it was supposed to end three days later. Mr. Yen was concerned about their people from the Holy Land who hadn't come out yet. He realized that the secret land had disappeared, along with the girl he had caught. One of his men speculated that while everyone was distracted, she had taken the opportunity to cast a secret spell and escape. She managed to flee into the outer forest but crash-landed because she was still too weak. She thought about how hard she had tried to escape and swore that as long as she could get out of there that day, she would do her best to cultivate. In the midst of her determination, her master arrived to rescue her and reminded her to give her best in her cultivation. She felt assured that her master came out of the secret land. He noticed the mark on her neck and then he directly took her to the airship and instructed her to tell her sister and the other girls to use the energy crystals inside the ring and improve themselves as soon as possible and gave her the ring. He decided to send her back because with her, he can't exert his full strength to fight and then the ship took off. Just then, Shrine Master Mr. Yan came to stop him. Then Yu Bai used multiple thunder punishments against Mr. Yan. After seeing her master fighting from space, Shan determined that when she gets back to Taibei's sword villa, then she will ask her sister and the others to help her right away. On the other side, Mr. Yan found that Yibai's cultivation level has been raised from the first grade of Tangjuan Realm to the ninth grade and guessed that he might have gained a lot of opportunities in the secret land. Yibai ignored his statement and asked straightforwardly if he hurt that young girl before he came. To which Mr. Yan told him that if he caught her, he would have cut her into pieces and asked him if he thinks that being a great realm master grants him to offend the nine holy lands. After hearing that, Yi Bai took out the purple flame, to which Yan guessed that it must be some kind of secret treasure. But to his surprise, it was a crucial flash from Yi Bai that disappeared his spiritual power and rule power in a single flash. Yi Bai caught him with his magical golden rope and banged him into the ground. In a moment, other members of the shrine approached them, and after seeing their master's condition, they challenged Yi Bai to fight one on one against them fairly, to which Yi Bai replied that after the old man, it should be her turn. Yan tried to provoke him to let go of him if he had the guts, but he didn't change his mind. Then Yan asked loudly for help from Elder Mu and Elder Chen, but they just found a black wall. They attacked the black wall to break it, but they failed, and then it was revealed that Yan was inside the big black coffin, and it even bounced back the full attacking power of the two half-emperors, making them wonder what kind of thergy it was. Elder Chen ordered everyone to attack it together, thinking that joint efforts could break it, but they failed again. Inside the coffin, Yam thought that Ye Bai had countless opportunities to hurt him, but he never did, and guessed that because he was a half-emperor of Taiki Shrine, hurting him would be like declaring war on all the holy lands. Outside the coffin, members of the shrine couldn't cut it with their full strength, but Elder Chen knew that Ye Bai could only destroy Elder Yen's body and that the divine soul of a half-emperor couldn't be easily destroyed. Suddenly, some kind of indicator reminded him that time was running out. Then he took out his sword and cut Yan's head to hurt him. Outside the coffin, they couldn't believe how someone could hurt a half-emperor. Yan's divine soul came out of his body and tried to escape. But to their surprise, the black coffin trapped his divine soul. Yan reminded him that he was now a divine soul, and all his attacks against him were ineffective. He needed to reach the saint realm to hurt him. He mocked him that his black coffin thurgy was about to disappear and threatened that as soon as it disappeared, he would have his men capture him alive. But just then, Ye Bai hit his soul with a golden rope, leading him to wonder how he could hurt him. Yan's disciples reminded him that Yan was the disciple of Emperor Spectre from Tanki Shrine, and as long as he let him go, they guaranteed that they would never hurt him. But Ye Bai already knew about their murderous intentions. Just then, he destroyed Yan's divine soul in a single flash. 
Other shrine members thought a lowly Tanzuan realm cultivator had herded a half-emperor and were scared that if such a cultivator grew more powerful, he would be a major threat to the Holy Land. They had already sent many people to hunt them down in the secret land, but soon he realized and asked Yi Bai if he had herded all the shining star shrine people they had sent to the secret land. He realized slowly, so Yi Bai mocked him that as a half-emperor, he was pretty dumb and took out Yan's ring, to which they furiously reminded Yi Bai to get his hands off their stuff as it belonged to their holy land. But he ignored them and took it. The system reminded him that the black casket would disappear in 90 seconds. Yi Bai suggested to them for the sake of their lives to leave the place within one minute, otherwise they would regret it. After hearing that, the furious shrine member threatened him that when the black casket disappeared, he was going to die. Seconds later, one shrine member gave an excuse to leave, stating that they had to go back to the Red Lotus sect to deal with an important issue, and a few more people followed him. When ten seconds were left, a few people were still there, so Yi Bai thought that none of them had chosen the right thing to do, as if they didn't want to live at all. After ten seconds, when the casket broke, they all attacked Yi Bai, but he easily handled them all. They all got terrified as his punch felt like a death blow. Then they decided to run, but it was too late. Yibai used Thunder Penalty, which created a Thunder Bomb and caused heavy chaos, leading them to fall on the ground. They realized his power was even stronger than a great Emperor Realm Cultivator's strike. After seeing his power, they had no wonder that he had the guts to hurt a half-Emperor and drag them down with him. He was totally a nightmare for them and observed the broken space inside the secret land. On the other side, Yibai failed to motivate his spiritual power. Then suddenly, the system reminded him that he had used the pill to successfully refine the secret land core within two hours, which had elevated him from the first grade Tongzhuan realm to the ninth grade. That's why all his veins and meridians were broken, resulting in his incapability of using spiritual power. He was also unable to move his body parts. If he had to stay in that spiritual, energy-free place, he wouldn't recover at all in a million years. When he reached the broken space, he realized that there was no place outside where he could absorb energy because the space had already messed up. He knew he was in trouble and could only rely on the spiritual stones to slowly heal himself. One day later, the ship arrived at Taibei Sword Villa. They were surprised to see that they had come back early, as it had only been eight days since the secret forest opened. As they approached the ship, they felt some weird quietness around it, so they wondered if their master was cultivating. But then suddenly, Taibei saw Shen crying. The spaceship had been locked, and by observing, it guessed that it was locked by their master. Fu contemplated that their master must have gotten into trouble, to which Tai Bai found that it must be serious, which was why he had sent Yushin back and chose to stay alone in that place. Then suddenly, the door opened and Shan told Tai Bai that she got their master in trouble and told her the entire story. A few minutes later, after hearing the entire story, Tai Bai determined to destroy the Holy Land and Tai Chi Shrine for daring to hurt her little sister and master. Tai Bai asked Chishan if their master had said anything to her when he sent her away because she knew that their master had great vision and must have had a backup plan. Shan recalled it and gave her a space ring that their master had told her to give to Tai Bai with instructions to make the best of it for her cultivation and asked her to wait for his return. They looked surprised to know what their master had told her to say to them. Fu was afraid that if he knew that they were going there to look for him, he would scold them all. One day ago, everything had been fine, but now it had totally changed, so Taibai guessed that her master had used forbidden skills. In between, Fu searched around and detected no vibes of living souls, to which Shan speculated that what if their master couldn't survive? But Fu interrupted her and reminded her not to underestimate their master. He suggested that they should listen to their master's words and go home to practice. Yoshan also agreed and added that maybe he would like to tour around and have fun. On the other side, Yi Bai absorbed the spiritual energy to regain his strength. During those days, he had used up all the spiritual stones in the Tanchi Half Emperor's ring, but the recovery process had only reached 10%, and he needed to figure out a way to get out of the space turbulence. He spotted a breach point and used multiple thunderstorm attacks to shift, finally leaving the hellhole. Outside, he spotted something weird, but was assured that he was in shape now and wouldn't be severely injured, though he didn't have spiritual power to protect himself and was already wrecked. But he didn't care if he got two more wounds. He knew that he just needed some time for recovery because in those two days, he had regained half of his spiritual power and his meridians and veins were gradually healing, but he still felt pain while walking. He spotted a woman who was running as everyone in the Changsha territory was trying to catch her, and she was the store manager of Renren Hall. After hearing about Renren Hall, Ye Bai wondered if he knew her. The men who followed her to catch her were told to stop running, but she knew that if she couldn't escape, she would do everything to avoid dragging Ms. President down even at the cost of her own life. Yibai called her to come to him and promised that she would survive that. 
So she looked at him and turned back to him. When she approached him, he asked about Renrin Hall, a magical pharmacy in Bay Yuling, to which she informed him that she was President Bay, the founder of Renrin Hall, and she was also the greatest doctor ever. After learning about Bai, he knew that she was the 99th apprentice and wondered if she was in the Changsu region and had even started Renrin Hall. Then why hadn't she reached out to her fellow apprentices in the past years? In between, the goons arrived to catch her and asked her to run, but she hid behind Yi Bai. They consistently told her to come to them quickly and promised that they wouldn't hurt her. Yi Bai reminded them that God sees everything, and when you do evil, it will find its way back to you. But they didn't listen to him and mocked him as a half disabled cultivator. Then Yubai asked if they didn't feel like someone was watching them from the sky, and just then, thunder erupted and burned one of the men. After seeing him vanish, they wondered it was sunny then, when did that thunder strike happen and found it intimidating. But before they could ask further, he vanished another man, and after that, the last man ran away quickly, wondering it must be a ghost. To which Yubai advised him that when he thinks that he had bumped into a ghost, don't doubt it, and he herded him with thunder as well. After witnessing such a horrific scene, she wondered that the young man was weak, but still he herded three shenting realm cultivators in a second without moving at all. Then she introduced herself as Lik Xuan, a manager of the fifth branch of Renren Hall, and thanked him for his help. But in return, he wanted to know everything about her president, each and every bit about her. She informed him that her president Bai was accidentally identified by them when she avoided those shrine members 300 years ago. Then she was captured by the people of the Tanki Shrine, but she didn't join them. Instead, she remained under house arrest in the Tianqi Shrine for a hundred years. In the 150th year after she gained their trust, the Tianqi Shrine agreed with her to find some talents proficient in medical skills in the Changsu territory. However, she had been watched by the powerful woman of the Holy King realm. After 250 years, she finally founded the Renren sect. She further informed him that she secretly developed branches, allowing the group to grow stronger, and also she sent people to look for ways to bring the dead back to life. She mentioned that President Bai had broken through the Saint Realm just a dozen days ago, but unexpectedly, the second holy son of the Tianqi Shrine suddenly asked the Holy King to let President Bai marry him. She denied his proposal and immediately told all the people of the Renren sect to rebel and flee the Changsu territory at full speed. She also had some people spread the word to other realms. Zhuon informed him that the wedding would be held in 15 days, but she was determined that even if she died, she would not marry that holy son. After hearing the whole story, he felt angry and thought that the Tanki Shrine had trapped his disciple for 300 years, and then they wanted her to marry their holy son. So he decided to give them a gift that would shock the whole world. Then he told Xuan that Bai and he were old friends and asked how good she was at medicine, to which Xuan told him that in terms of medical skills, no matter how ill a person was, she could bring them back. So he asked her to examine him. When she checked him, she found him in a terrible condition, so she told him about the treatment option. Conservative treatment could only be done in a very inefficient way, and it would take at least seven days to treat him. She started treatment from the bottom. Yibai thought that if he cooperated with her treatment, he would be cured in four or five days at the earliest, so that he could break through from grade nine of the Tongzhuan realm to the Shenting realm as soon as possible, unlocking his third wave of cards. He also wondered if the Tianqi Shrine had captured his other disciples to in prison, and even if none of his disciples were in prison, the enemy of his enemy was his friend. When she started treating him, she instructed him to get undressed, and when he followed her instructions, she shockingly reminded him that there was no need to get completely naked. But to her surprise, he was wearing underpants. Two days later, outside the Tianqi Shrine Palace, Ye Bai took a look at the palace stealthily and remembered what Xuan had informed him. The Tianqi Shrine was stratified with the outermost layer and the second layer serving as the living and practicing places for the outer and inner disciples, respectively. Furthermore, the innermost layer was the place where the emperor, the holy lord, the other emperors, the half-emperors, and the elders live and practiced. Most importantly, President Bai was under house arrest in the innermost layer. After getting this information, he instructed her to send this message to Tebe Sword Villa. At the Tianqi Shrine's gate, he was stopped by the guards. Although he knew that his meridians had been repaired and his injury was no longer serious, this action could only be taken by deception, not by force. Then he showed them a token and suddenly held their necks and performed some magic that led them to transform into another space. He informed them that it was his space and asked a question, but before he could ask, they interrupted him and reminded him that they were from the Tanki Shrine. Then he hit them with his golden magical rope, which hurt them a lot. After seeing two of his colleagues in pain, the third one gave up and was ready to tell him everything. So he asked him to tell everything about the Huati Pool of the Tanki Shrine. He informed him that the Huati Pool was nearly the size of a lake and was located in the core disciple area. It was guarded by holy kings and they checked it every day, 
so it was impossible to steal the treasure of the Huadi Pool. But Ye Bai wanted to create an exception. He knew that there was another heavenly realm between the two places, so the news of the death of a half-emperor in Tangxi should not have reached there. Therefore, he decided to use Yan's identity for a while. Only half-emperors or emperors could see through the magic of imitation. So if he walked through the door without meeting anyone from the core area along the way, suddenly a man asked Yan why he had come back so soon that time and Yi Bai got stunned. Yi Bai knew that the goal was within reach so he didn't want to give up at that point and try to fool him. The Holy King informed him that he had saved a hundred years of merit and finally got the qualification to practice in the Huadi pool for one day, to which Yi Bai just praised him. The Holy King suspected that Elder Yan seemed different that day. Later on their way, Yan told him to go and practice and just then, he disappeared. Seeing his power, the Holy King also desired to have that kind of power. At night, outside the Huadi, the guard at the door looked excited that after 200 years, finally someone was coming to practice and the Holy King showed his qualification pass. After observation, they passed him and opened the door for him. Inside the Huadi, he knew that every moment there was precious and took off his clothes immediately. But to his surprise, it was Yi Bei who managed to sneak into the Huadi pool because of him. Otherwise, he was afraid that he couldn't successfully pass the extremely strict inspection. He already knew that it was the key protected area of the Tianqi Shrine, so in case of any abnormality, it would attract the half-emperor or even the great emperor. One day later, it was time for him to get out. He picked up his clothes and left the place. Yabai realized that the guards had spent the day on the inspection, so he needed to be careful in their operation. Two hours later, a magical ball dropped into the holy pool and suddenly Yi Bai emerged from that ball. He found that the progress of cultivation in that spiritual fluid was several times that of the outside world and suspected that there was some mysterious power in that liquid. He wondered if there was something even more amazing down there. He remembered that he had taken his disciples to explore various secret places to look for all kinds of opportunities, and in the end they gained congenital Tao body, Naim Yin holy body, Zuen Yin body. But for him, it was just a treasure that could improve the state of mind and soul. He remembered that he never got a chance to change his weak constitution, but luckily he was resurrected, so he decided to make a big change. As he fell slowly, he felt the horrible pressure, and if he got out now, he was afraid that he would be squeezed into a meat pie. Meanwhile, at the Tianqi Shrine Heartland, Bai looked up, thinking that she should be with her master soon because she was trying to find a way to bring him back from the dead, without knowing that he was already resurrected. She also worried about her martial sisters, as if they got hurt, no one could cure them. In the pool, as Yi Bai got deeper, he spotted the light reflected from the stone. When he got close to it, he found the real treasure in the Huadi pool. He had definitely found the treasure but wondered how he could put it in the barren space. He thought that if he got out, he would be squeezed into a meat pie by the surrounding terrible spiritual pressure. So he got the idea to use the thunder punishment and found that the hardness of the surrounding rock had been greatly altered by the presence of that treasure. However, only 36 thunderbolts could be sent out in a day and use them to excavate the treasure inside the Huadi pool. He realized that it would take 70 more thunderbolts to excavate the entire treasure, which meant two more days at the bottom of the pool. At the bottom of the pool, Yi Bai sat down to cultivate. Since the spiritual power of that pool was several times stronger than that outside, it was perfect for its cultivation. Moreover, being at the bottom of the pool meant that people patrolling above couldn't find anything unusual at all. Two days later, when he opened his eyes, his cultivation level had reached the Shenting realm. If he could have had such luck before his resurrection, he would have been able to destroy most of the Nine Holy Lands in 300 years. Then he performed a magical spell on the green treasure. After collecting the piece of supreme treasure, the pressure at the bottom of the pool disappeared. He jumped out and performed another spell to collect the water splash. The next day, the guards discovered that the Huadi pool had disappeared, immediately alerting the shrine. People recognized it as the highest alert since the establishment of the Tanki Shrine, speculating that something big must have happened. Bai, upon hearing the chaos, felt assured that it would be better if the chaos led to the cancellation of the wedding. On the other scene, Yi Bai had made the breakthrough in his cultivation and collected the supreme treasures. Now it was time to go to that place. He changed his identity again and went to the Grand Elder. They were informed that the Huadi pool had disappeared, and then he grabbed another guard's neck. The guard explained that they checked it carefully every day without any negligence. After that, they asked for an admin record for the last few months, discovering that it was last used three days ago. They decided to search for the suspect throughout the city, guessing that maybe the thief was still nearby. The order was given to lock down the whole city and instructed them to search the area around the Huadi pool thoroughly. 
After hearing about their move, Yibai needed to be more careful with his gift-giving plans in a few days. At the heavenly prison of the shrine, Yibai was surprised to find that a squad of Holy King Realm guards patrolling around the place had already left. This allowed him to easily determine how many people were inside the prison. He then entered the prison and quickly changed his identity to that of a sweeper. While on the way, someone called the sweeper to go down to the lower floor to clean up, and he went to meet them. In the third level of the underground prison, where no one visited for ten days or half a month, his superior suggested that he simply pretend to be cleaning up. Yibai knew that the third floor held prisoners with heavy punishments, but they didn't seem to be of much help to his next plan. Suddenly, on their way, he heard a sound coming from behind a large door. His superior told him that they couldn't go there because the criminal behind the door had been cast under a forbidden spell. To lift that spell, one had to be at least at the Holy King realm and use the correct methods. Then his superior left him alone to clean the place. As soon as his superior left, Yibai reverted to his original form and approached the large door, passing through it easily. He found a surprising thing. Each cell, there was a separate enclosed space. He realized that he was at the fourth level of the prison, so noise wouldn't attract anyone's attention. As he ventured forward, he heard someone, and then he asked them about their status and strength so that he could assist them. An old man opened his eyes and saw the aura of a first-graded Shenting realm, and then he mentioned that he was the former second elder of the Tianchi Holy Land, Lian Yuan, who had been locked up for 700 years. Yibai decided to help him escape and broke the prison with a single punch, which led Lion to wonder that Yibai's punch was comparable to the full power of a Saint Realm Master. Yibai proposed a condition that if Lion served him for ten years and gave his wisp of divine soul, he would set him free. Lion found the deal attractive and agreed to his terms, showing his deep-seated hatred for the Holy Land. After seeing him, Yibai realized that he just needed to remove the sealing spell from his body. He used the magic spell of Recognize Divine Soul Confinement, and the sealing spell was removed from the old man's body. Then he introduced himself and assured that he would keep his word, and after ten years he would be free. He gave him the spiritual water so he could regain his strength soon. Lion recognized that the water was from Huadi Pool and wondered how he got it. Lion asked if he wanted to subdue others and he could help him with that because he knew most of the people there and could lead the way. People in Laka wondered how there were Holy King Realm guards all over the place and they had all been cast under a sealing spell, so how could the young man remove it? A moment later, Elder Lion regained his cultivation and after seeing him, people asked him to help them, to which he replied that he was a servant of his master and he only listened to his orders. After looking around, Yibai worried that he couldn't find her in that lockup. Seeing his concern, Lion asked him if he was looking for someone. Yibai asked if there was a fifth underground floor in that heavenly prison, but Lion confirmed that it had only four floors. However, there were also two secret chambers for extremely dangerous criminals. Then, a few minutes later, they were near the secret chamber. Yibai was surprised because he didn't expect there to be a concealment array, so he broke the wall to enter the chamber. Lion told him that he had heard that the person in the cell had caused a lot of troubles for the Holy Land back then. Yibai detected from the iron door that there was a girl captured inside the chamber, and after being sure, he asked Lion to open it. When he opened the gate, they spotted a mysterious girl. When he came close to her, he asked her how she got in there, to which she threatened that she would raise the entire Tianchi Shrine to the ground sooner or later. But when she looked up the familiar voice, she was stunned to see her master and started crying and eagerly hugged him. Lying back shocked that the most dangerous criminal in the prison called him master. Yibai freed her from the handcuffs and asked again how she got in, to which she told him she accidentally volunteered to get in and asked him to go easy on her for that offense. She further explained that 130 years ago, she accidentally found out that there were some powerhouses imprisoned on the fourth floor of the heavenly prison in Tainki Shrine. She then planned to turn them into her undead puppets, thinking that her power would definitely increase, but she was marked as an extremely dangerous figure by the Holy Land, and in the end, two half-emperors had joined forces to subdue her. He angrily reacted to her, stating that she sent herself to the bottom of that prison. After seeing his anger, she tried to cool him down, stating that she would listen to him from now on. Suddenly, the system appeared to give him a reward of truth-sharing 30 for re-encountering with a disciple for 108 in which he may share the truth of the dead, truth of the sword, truth of arrays and architecture. Yibai knew that the big day of the Holy Land was in ten days, so he reserved that power for that time. She told him that her undead puppets were still continuing to cultivate in the summoning space. She then released them. Moreover, she had also harvested the souls of four half-emperor powerhouses and a dozen late Saint King powerhouses in that place. After knowing that he had destroyed them, she explained that if she wanted to find more powerful souls, she had plenty of choices. Otherwise, if the Holy Land didn't plan to keep her alive, she would become a dead soul. 
She understood and asked how he had gotten in there. Then he explained the whole story. A few minutes later, she also determined to destroy the entire shrine for keeping her fellow for 300 years. Yibai gave her the Huati water and told her to break through the half-emperor realm within 10 days and she agreed. He instructed that after finishing sweeping the fourth floor, they both should get themselves recovered and felt confident that the shrine would enjoy the great gifts that he brought to them. Seven days later, at the Tianqi Shrine Gate, a member of the shrine asked him about his relative force to report it to their superiors. Yibai told him that he was there for fun, and they still welcomed them. Inside the shrine, his disciples showed eagerness and told him to take action to take away Ling, otherwise, they wouldn't be able to save Ling when all the members of the Holy Land had arrived. To this, Yibai assured her that they would get rid of them once and for all. She whispered that they had three strong great emperor realm masters, but Yibai believed that with his two subdues, it was only a matter of time before both of them became great emperor realm masters and suggested that he would deal with two of them, and the remaining one would be left for them. Later, it was announced that the three great emperor realm masters of the Tianqi Shrine had arrived, and after them, Bai also arrived. Lion informed Yi Bai that according to the traditional wedding ceremony of the Tanki Shrine, newlyweds would walk from the two sides to the middle and kneel down to worship the Holy Lord of Tanqi and vow to each other. But Bai had already planned to hurt the Holy Son in front of the large crowd. As the wedding ceremony began, Yi Bai threw his golden rope to take Bai and declared that the bride was his. Then she noticed her master and felt assured, but he knew that she must have suffered. People around them recognized him as the same arrogant man who came in arrogantly and suspected that he was a lover of the bride. To this, a second holy son loudly ordered him to let go of his bride and release an attack, but Yibai stopped his attack. His father got angry with Yibai for spoiling his son's wedding and unleashed magical energy with full strength, which later transformed into a powerful sword. Bai recognized it as sword energy that belongs to Kai Tai Bai, and just then suddenly, Yibai's all other disciples came to attack the shrine. Then Yi Bai told the shrine to enjoy the great gifts that he brought to them. Yi Bai gave a chance to leave to those who didn't want to be affected by the coming big fight, otherwise they would be herded. The second son of the Holy King asked Yi Bai to get his hands off Ling and attacked him, but his other disciple tackled him and blocked his attack. His father got angry and was ready to attack, questioning how many times she could block his attack. However, she threatened him that his son might become one of her undead puppets. Now they recognized that she was the one who could use undead necromancy. He asked if she thought she could walk out alive by holding his son hostage, to which Yi Bai vanished his son in a moment. After seeing his son's death, he attacked furiously and released his powerful skill, the mysterious palm attack, but Yi Bai didn't care about it and easily managed it. The great emperor was shocked to see the power of the spatial laws. The other shrine emperor guessed that they didn't seem to be trying to escape, but they created an apocalypse of the undead and then suddenly, the shrine was covered by the undead. The great emperor ordered to hurt her, Otherwise, their holy land would suffer heavy casualties, but Taibei took charge to stop them. On the other hand, Fu and Yushin attacked the other two emperors. Suddenly, they looked at Ye Bai, who looked like something extremely powerful. They wondered if he was a monster because human beings can't increase their cultivation level that rapidly and found that his aura had been elevated to the half-emperor level and wondered about his next move. Don't forget to hit that like button and share it with your friends. We love reading your comments, so please leave your thoughts and suggestions below. We have a lot more exciting content coming your way.